Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this 19th day of June. We are glad you have joined us today. This is the Indigenous Day of Prayer and Father's Day. We invite you from wherever you find yourself to come into this service of acknowledgement and of wonder. The service begins with an acknowledgement of the land written by John Terpstra, a poet, writer, and cabinet maker from Hamilton, and a member of St. Cuthbert's Presbyterian Church. I also will be using some pieces from his book, Naked Trees, in my reflections. Our music director, Eleanor Daly, provides us with an online music bulletin every week. Scroll down our web page to enjoy it. In honor of Father's Day, this morning's choral music is sung by a variety of men's choirs, and in recognition of the approaching first day of summer, the postlude features a virtual performance of a movement of Vivaldi summer from his iconic Four Seasons. John Terpstra has this to say about the land acknowledgement I am beginning the service with. He writes, the wounded only child in the greeting and acknowledgement refers both to the only child of the creator in the Christian story and to the teacher born to a virgin in the Hudnesoni story who travels east over the ocean to teach the creator's ways to the people there. He returns many years later, wounded and bloody. They wouldn't listen, he says. So hear these words. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga, the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat nations. We are gathered on the traditional lands of the wolf and cougar, rattlesnake and bear, turtles on the bay shore, salmon in the water, eagles in the sky. The bur oak, black walnut, and red maple, maidenhair fern, pitcher plant, bloodroot. And the people of these and many other nations who are spread across this land as far as car can drive, canoe paddle, kayak glide, or foot fall, to greet the Creator. We follow a wounded only child whom we ourselves may have wounded through the woods and over creeks and streets of this good earth that we share, the landscapes of a life we are blessed to lead, who is our wilderness guide and spiritual outfitter who slips between the trees and is gone, who sits beside us at evening fire with story and song. We sing in the sacred and holy spirit of life that fills every lung and shakes each leaf as if it were the only leaf, that blows spring-like through the open windows, that flows and does not stop flowing, as long as the earth turns, the sun rises, and the day begins. We are gathered on the traditional territory of British immigrant and American refugee, a tradition of settlement that began a mere 200 years ago. We are gathered on a territory to which migrants from Europe, Africa, Asia, and all lands of the earth have come by choice or necessity. At the terminus of the Underground Railway, Pier 21, the CN Station on Murray Street, Pearson Airport. We are gathered on lands long home to nations and peoples now displaced, who loved it here as much as we do, who may have loved it more and better. We gather to greet and thank the Creator to place before the Maker of all, all of our contradictions, confusions, complicities, and our hope. And we are gathered on the traditional territory of people who lived close to the ground, who touched and were intimate with this patch of earth, its waters, who knew and named the many more and wild animals with whom they shared life and death here as brothers and sisters, who dwelled in the beauty of this place in ways we can only imagine, bound as we are to the streets of the city and to the paths of settlement. Let us pray. 
creator of the world, eternal God, we have come from many places for a little while. Redeemer of humanity, God with us, we have come with all our differences, seeking common ground. Spirit of unity, go between God. We have come on journeys of our own to a place where journeys meet. So here on this nearly summer's day, let us take time together, for when paths cross and pilgrims gather, there is much to share and celebrate. Amen. Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is not always easy for many reasons. Our father may have died or be estranged or living far away from us. A father may be very present in our lives, a dad who is there for us, a grandfather who looks out for us. For others who have never had an opportunity to be a father, this is sometimes a difficult day. We think of young dads this morning and pray for them, pray for them strength and wisdom. And we give thanks for fathers. Bob Dylan composed this song in 1970 called Father of the Night. I read it on this Father's Day. Father of the night, father of day, father who taketh the darkness away, father who teacheth the bird to fly, builder of rainbows up in the sky, father of loneliness and pain, father of love and father of rain, father of day, father of night, father of black, father of white, father who builds the mountain so high, who shapeth the cloud up in the sky, father of time, father of dreams, father who turneth the rivers and streams, father of grain, father of wheat, father of cold and father of heat, father of air and father of trees, who dwells in our hearts and our memories, father of minutes, father of days, father of whom we most solemnly praise. Our scripture reader for today is Jim Benson. His text is from Job, which has some of the most beautiful poetry ever written, words that conjure up the cosmos and take our breath away. God is asking Job some questions here. Jim begins with these words, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you know. Listen carefully as he reads this scripture poetry. Listen to the beauty of the words and the creator's call for us to notice the grandeur of it all. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you know who set its measurements. Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring tape on it? On what were its footings sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang in unison and all the divine beings shouted, who enclosed the sea behind doors? And it burst forth from the womb when I made the clouds its garment, the dense clouds its wrap when I imposed my limit on it put on a bar and doors and said, you may come this far, but no further. Here your proud waves stop. In your lifetime, have you commanded the morning and formed the dawn of its place? So we'll take hold of earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. You turn it over like a clay for seal. So it stands out like a colorful garment. Light is upheld from the wicked, the uplifted arm broken. Have you gone to the sea's sources, walked in the chamber of the deep? Have death's gates been revealed to you? Can you see the gates of deep darkness? Have you surveyed the earth's expanses? Tell me no if you know everything about it.
I am trying to record my uh, reflection outside and I'm hiding along the Humber River. It's very, very windy outside. The park where I want it to record is too wide open to do it. So I'm doing it from this spot. I want to talk about the need for us as people of faith to reconnect with the creation, to understand at a deeper level um, how much we depend on the earth, on all the other creatures and flowers and plants and trees that are on the earth, and that without them we do not exist, and that they in fact are holy and sacred. So as I said at the beginning of the service, I'm going to be using a book called um, Naked Trees, and I'm going to just have a few excerpts from them. I want to give you a sense of how the author John, how he sees trees and senses the wonder in them. The book itself um, it doesn't make it clear who he's referring to in the early parts of it. He has the voice of an older woman at times, and then a voice of a younger child at times. But it's all about urban trees. And, um, and part of it is about the fact that on this one street where this older woman lives, a whole bunch of trees are going to be cut down. And, uh, and looking at the tragedy of that whenever a tree dies. The tragedy of that and the emptiness of that in the neighborhood in which it found its home. He has a quote by Martin Buber which says, but it can also happen if Will and Grace are joined that as I contemplate the tree I am drawn into a relation. One should not try to dilute the meaning of the relation. Relation is reciprocity. So I have three sections of the readings, so two from the beginning of the book. The first one I've entitled Shadows on the Walls. Something I never bothered to notice before, or simply didn't notice because I never had this trouble sleeping, are the shadows on the walls. When I'm lying in bed now, I can imagine myself lying in the middle of the tree I had always wanted to climb but was too old to climb by the time it was big enough and strong enough to hold me. When the branches and leaves move back and forth across the walls and the ceiling, it's like I'm being rocked to sleep and it's a lovely feeling. It's lovely to feel that young again. You ever climbed a tree? Have you ever been in a tree house? And that glorious feeling when you're up there and there's a wind and you feel the whole tree moving but feel safe in the arms of the tree, it is truly, truly wonderful. It's been a long time since I've been in a tree house, but I'd really like to build one and be in one again while I still have some time. The other piece I wanted to quote from early in the book is called Branches, and it's about the movement of the trees. Trees are intended to move. Although rooted to one spot, trees are expected to be in some kind of constant motion. No tree is ever entirely still. The movement of growth is dis indiscernible, but indisputable, a given. And the delectable shifting of branch and leaf, the minute swaying of the trunk. A tree moves because it must. The wind blows and it cannot refuse. It moves toward nothing but flails the same bit of air. The youngest branches, those furthest up, tend to be the wild ones that become at times unruly. The older middle-aged branches are by now less easily influenced and provide a much needed steadying effect, while the trunk itself moves only in the most dire circumstances. 
Yet just beneath the trunk's somber, unyielding exterior flows a liquid concentrate. And it is this wondrous substance which, when it has coursed much diluted into those upper reaches, becomes the cause of their remarked frenzy. The tree, in effect, filling its own sails, creator of wind and of the seeming stillness. There's nothing more beautiful than watching trees in the wind, especially if you can also have some light on the leaves. The powerful sense of that tree in motion, in a dance, just, just to be in a dance for no other reason. The second two excerpts, the first is called Story. When a tree first splits its seed in the dark and thrusts through the surface, the earth finds its voice, the story begins. The story emerges as they all do from out of the soil. It is a simple enough tale at first, but before long events are pushing every which way. The narrative grows more complicated at every turn, is made dense by the many related individual lives, each of which hangs to its place in the chronicle by the single ample thread of having once lived and died. You may come to have your favorites, of course, but there are no heroes in this story. No one is more heroic than the next. And a shape is slowly evolving, one in which past and present are coexistent and to which they are both equal contributors. A shape that is open and spreading, constantly shifting about as the drawn out telling deftly tends to its tiniest details. But before the story is even half told, it is already difficult to imagine how this one small plot of earth gave rise to such complex fullness, or how all the divergent forces were able to coalesce into a coherent common tale, much less one of a common tongue. Every tree describes a distinct culture. A tree is the earth's own articulation of the living countryside. Do you know what it's like sometimes when you're by a very, very old tree? It's almost like you want to hug it. You want to respond to it somehow. It seems to be wise in its standing, uh, patient in its years of being in one spot, understanding of the story that is going on around it. And the second one in this part is called speech. They speak as they grow with great patience and apparent premeditation. Those who wish to listen should stand facing the trunk, lean in until their forehead touches bark and wait. The initial sound heard is deep, reverberative, a foghorn at night in a fjord. After a time, lighter tones will be heard coming from further up where the tree divides. Still higher notes will enter into hearing as the tree branches higher. Until from the topmost twigs come a sound that is by turns almost out of earshot or can be mistaken for that of a bird. By now, however, it is mid-morning. The skin of the forehead has conformed to the furled bark. But still, a good while must pass before the multifarious sounds resolve themselves into syllables, before the syllables unite into words, and the words begin their labored climb into intelligibility. For a tree says everything simultaneously. In theory, at least, there are no limits to the speech of trees. I like that. Trees do talk. They talk to me. 
They talk in their movement, they talk in their sounds, they talk in their silence. They definitely speak. The last two pieces I want to read. The first is called Wardrobe. When the time came to clear out the house, we saved the wardrobe standing in the corner of her bedroom for last. It was huge. It had also never hung clothes because inside was where they had stored all the family albums and keepsakes for the two generations they lived in the house. But even empty, it was heavy. It felt as if we would have to pry it up from the floor to get it onto a dolly, as if it had grown roots into the floorboards, as if the styles and rails that held the whole thing together had traveled beneath the floor and grafted themselves onto the joists below, had grown out toward either side of the house and spread up and down the outside walls, wrapping the entire dwelling, tying their knot tight with rafters at the roof peak. Within its branching web, two generations lived and moved as freely as the squirrels. If you think of the wood after a tree is cut and what it's used for, if you think of items in your own home that are made of wood and some of them very old, are they not still alive with the story of the tree? And are they not being used in your home as something that delights and warms you and holds you even? The last one, the table. It's entitled Headiness. The table around which we are seated tonight felt the chill of its own nakedness before we came together. And to be honest, so did we. These four legs elevate a surface that presents us now with an evening meal, fruit of the chef's afternoon. When our arms pass the bowls or reach for the tall cups of wine, or when they shift and move to the nuances of our conversation, it is possible to think of other limbs. And when our heads leaned back just now and everyone burst with laughter, I wanted to say I saw a crown shaken by the breeze. Perhaps it is the wine. But tell me if tonight we do not feel as large and heady as the gods. These slim trunks then surround our feet and the impression tonight is of being one together with our fellow creatures up among their many shining leaves. John is a, a carpenter, a cabinet maker. His love of trees and his appreciation and honoring of wood is, is very, very evident. I think this honoring of all of life is something that you and I need to be about far more intentionally than we usually are. And I like his writings in Naked Trees because it places the trees in a city. It allows those trees to have dignity and show their worth and remind us that nature is everywhere. We do not have to go somewhere else to experience it, appreciate it, and be held by it. Amen. This morning's virtual musical offering features the Fairlawn Avenue Senior Choir Men and guests singing Eleanor Daly's Rise Up My Love, accompanied on the piano by Anne Fraser Burke. Let us listen to this gift of music.
some announcements. First, some information about Fairlawn Summer Services. Please plan to join us online. Due to the lack of airflow in the assembly hall and the summer heat in the sanctuary, we have made the decision that our July and August services will be online only. A special event that you might be very interested in is Every Brilliant Thing, directed by Scott Denton, on Monday, June the 27th at 7 p.m. at Fairlawn. Please join us for a working rehearsal. Every Brilliant Thing is a life-affirming, wholesome and simple story of how existential hope is achieved by focusing on the miracles of life's minutiae. This one-person play is about depression and the lengths we will go for those we love. It deals with a subject that touches us all and is so important to talk about. Space is limited and registration is required. And you are welcome to join our online coffee chat time at 1.15 this afternoon. Please join me in prayer. Loving Creator, we give our thanks. Whenever we join together, we should give thanks. So let us join our hearts and minds together and think of all creation and the Creator's gifts. Let us think of our mother, the earth upon whom we walk and who supports us and nurtures life in all its forms. We think of the minerals, the fungi and bacteria that give life to soil, bodies and systems. We pray we can learn to walk on earth with more respect. Let us think of the reasons why we are gathered, for this place in which we gather, for our homes, for our apartments, if we're outside, and for all of the animals and plants that call this place home. Let us think of the whole human family whose livelihood and well-being depends on the well-being of the earth. We lift up the men, women, and children who are displaced from their homes. Let us turn our minds to the sacred waters of the world, the great oceans, aquifers, lakes, rivers, and streams, the life and spirit that lives in the waters and those that give itself to be our food. Let us now turn our thoughts to the plant life of the Creator's world, that which is below ground, the roots and vegetables, that which puts justice head above the ground, the grasses, medicines, plants and bushes, all of the many kinds of good fruit the Creator has given us, and finally the great trees of the forest that we know of as the standing ones. Let us think of all our kindred animals, those that crawl, walk, swim, and fly. We give thanks for those that provide food for us, those that sustain cycles in their work and living, those that provide companionship and beauty. Let us think of the birds of the air, the feathered ones that are the messengers between us and the Creator. And let us think of the relationships that sustain life in this beloved community. We think of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, who nurture, guard, and sustain as they grow together. These relationships are gifts from the Creator and our sustenance. Let us think of Jesus, the peacemaker, the Creator's Son, who taught us the true meaning of reconciliation, loving Creator, we give our thanks. Amen. Just before the blessing, I want to read a poem by Margaret Atwood called The Moment. <clears throat> the moment when, after many years of hard work and long voyage, you stand at the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this. Is the same moments the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. 
You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming. We never belonged to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. And now this blessing. May you walk with God in the sharp pain of growing, in the midst of confusion, in the bright light of knowing. May you live in God, in God's constant compassion, in God's infinite wisdom, in God's passion for peace. May you walk with God and live in God and remain with God this day and forever. Amen.